we starting now? I think we will wait a couple of minutes till everyone gathers. Okay. Um, on YouTube and on Zoom, but oh, we're live right now. Hi everyone, we'll just give one more win minute for everyone to settle in and we'll start. All right, I think I'm gonna go ahead and start. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the seventh lecture in our LTU College of Architecture and Design lecture series. LT Quad offers diverse programs from rich variety of topic, including architecture, graphic design, industrial design, um, game design, interior design, and transportation design. My name is Bilgen Rosaltek. Uh, I'm the assistant professor and director of uh, industrial design program in LTU. And I'm happy to introduce our speakers today. Today, we will be listening a presentation by organizational team of Amateur Hour exhibition. We have Alexandro Pagura, Claire Bryan, 
Cara Dawkins and Evelyn Herman um, presenting today. As the advisor of the organization, I have the honor to introduce them. I'm very excited about it. Amateur Hour is an exhibition that displays the formative work of students designers prior to their professional careers. This is a student-led exhibition started as an industrial design program initiative and quickly grown into a multidisciplinary show, which we celebrate in LTU. Uh, these designers in exhibition come from various disciplines within LTU College of Architecture. LTU Amadar Hour exhibition opened with a virtual opening at the beginning of September. The exhibition has been selected part of the Detroit Month of Design's main event and was part of their program schedule. Amateur Hour exhibition is open to LTU's open at um, Lawrence Tech's DCDT gallery at downtown and can be visited by appointment till mid-November. Um, with that said, I'll pass the mic to the team. Hello and welcome to Amateur Hour. So uh, I'm sure you heard, you heard a little bit of an intro, but we'll have the team introduce ourselves. Uh, I am Alessandro Pagura. I am a senior in industrial design. I am one of the co-founders and co-curators of Amateur Hour. Uh, I work primarily with uh, furniture and home goods, though I love designing anything and I'm currently interning at Pop House. Uh, but this event was a great, fun thing to do. My name is Claire Bryan, and I am a senior in industrial design as well. I am the other uh, co-founder and co-curator along with Alessandro. I have a passion for designing spaces and interior design, and I am currently working at Modern City, a property management and design company in Detroit. Hi, everyone. My name is Evelyn Herman, and I'm the organizational guru on our team. During school time, I am a graphic design and business major. And then in my free time, I enjoy painting and making large scale installations. Hi guys, my name is Kara. I am a junior in the graphic design program. Uh, I was brought on to help with uh, branding and creating graphics for the event. And I work for Woodward and Willis, which is the uh, faculty directed student run design studio at LTU. And here we are in the, in the physical space. Um, so these are our student designers that we had for the show. Uh, we'll talk to you about their pieces a little bit later. Um, so Claire can give you a little rundown of how this show was created. Yeah, so our show was created by Alessandra and I. Um, we were given the opportunity to uh, possibly have an event for the Detroit Month of Design and Mir uh, presented us with this opportunity and we just kind of went with it. Uh, the show has been entirely student run and entirely student work. We've had Mir as an advisor for us, but for most of the part, it was us uh, doing the communication and the, uh, all of the correspondence between us and DCDT, between us and Design Corps who puts on Detroit Month of Design. And so it's been a really great experience. Um, we have students from all over the college. We've got graphic design, interior design, industrial design students, and all of the pieces are physical work. That was one of our uh, requirements for entries. And so something that can be placed into the gallery and be experienced in person, which we would have liked to do a little bit more and have more opportunities for that. But some recent events have led to a lack of in-person things sometimes. So as Claire touched on, we had uh, an original vision for this gallery back in February and early March, um, which is really when the first uh, submissions for design course start opening for the design month. So our original vision was really inspired by previous exhibitions at the space, uh, especially last year's design month event that Form and Seek had in the DCDT. So we wanted to have a similar event of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people coming to see it. Uh, it's laid, uh, the space is laid out for a lot of foot traffic and really like an in-person event, especially with an in-person opening. Um, so with that, we started uh, our submission to the, uh, excuse me, our submission to Design Corps 
uh, which was due in early March. Uh, and we also had um, our open calls going, around, going on around the same time. Uh, but obviously a lot of things changed right away. So we had to have all of our open calls essentially be digital. Uh, and that was something that we think we struggled with a little bit was trying to get the word out when none of us were on campus and really trying to get people excited and involved with the event. Um, and really having to think on our feet was really, um, was a huge part of this whole process. It was uh, quite crazy. Um, and, but obviously then the next step for us was uh, Claire and I were realizing pretty quickly that we couldn't do this alone. So we had to look for basically a branding wizard. Uh, so we found Kara through the show LTU co-ed site because we loved her work. We found her work and asked her to be in the gallery. And she also accepted to do our, our branding and graphics for the show. And then we brought on Evelyn because uh, Claire and I, we love the big picture stuff, but our organizational skills are not uh, up, to the, up to Evelyn snuff. And she really brought us up and organized. Um, and really adaptability was a huge uh, thing for us. We had to quickly change because we originally wanted a big, large scale in-person event that we then realized we had to switch to be accommodating to people who couldn't see it and really accommodate you know, that big, nasty coronavirus pandemic. So we uh, obviously we still focused a lot on the physical space. Um, we made it a point to uh, really still have an interesting physical event that you could go see, but we really wanted to also focus on the digital experience. Yeah, the, um, the website we quickly realized was going to be a really integral part of the event. Um, so we really spent a lot of time and effort uh, not only setting up the gallery in a, in a you know, visually pleasing and effective way, but also making sure the website was uh, uh, sort of mimicking that physical space. And then in a strange way, we actually have to thank the coronavirus because it let us push our event farther and be more interactive than we'd had it before. So on top of showing the work online and in person, we also do podcasts so that you can hear straight from all of our designers why they made what they made and then a little bit of insight into the fun stories that went along with making it. Yes, and I think that's something we all found throughout setting up this gallery was we felt very emboldened by the coronavirus situation that originally going into design month, if it was a standard year, we would have felt, at least me personally, would have felt very, uh, you know, very, very nervous because we're on the level of so many other amazing designers in the area, people who've been doing a design month for almost 10 years. And, you know, we're student run coming in, trying to do our own thing, but the pandemic and the situations that unfolded that kind of made a level playing field for everyone. And we really felt emboldened to try new things and to try things that we were interested in without thinking like, oh, is this the right way to do this? Is this the wrong way? Because we quickly realized, hey, there is no wrong way now. We can do it essentially however we want. We get to make up these rules. So uh, if you want to check out our digital experience, uh, or we have a YouTube channel that we put our podcasts up. We have three episodes up now, and we're going to be releasing uh, the rest uh, about three times a week. Going forward, we have our website, ltuamateurhour.com, and then we ended up marketing a lot through our Instagram as well. So we're going to take you a little bit through uh, our design pieces because we have to give a shout out to our designers. Uh, so uh, the first piece here is mine. Uh, it is a furniture piece that um, was designed for a, cl a class of mine last year, first semester project that I then submitted to uh, a show that was curated by Studio Radish and Form and Seek for Studio Radish's big studio opening. And uh, it was a lighting project that I had done for airports that acts as a physical barrier and sort of a calling device uh, within loud and crowded spaces. Uh, so I submitted the design to them that I had prototyped uh, that was not at this level. And they chose the piece and decided to manufacture it for the event. So that's what this piece is. Um, this piece. Uh, Brian's is one of my favorites because uh, he's a Canadian designer. Uh, he's an LTU master student, um, but the border got shut down and this was something that we had there. And yet another coronavirus situation we had to work around. Uh, so we, we, uh, we had everyone come in and set up their pieces on their own, but with Brian's, he obviously could not just simply come across the border, even though he's only you know, 10, 20 minutes away from the DCDT. So we had to ship his piece across the border and I had to set it up. And I really 
uh, thank him and admire him for still working around the issues to get his piece there. And he's been very passionate about it. And so really, it's an easel that he created out of bent wood uh, for his daughter that has a magnet there. And it's uh, just made out of two simple bent pieces. And another piece we have is uh, Amelia's piece from, I believe it was the Furniture and Millworks class. Uh, so this project um, was a furniture piece uh, that was based off of a well-known designer, uh, Charles Rene McIntosh's work. Um, so she used oak, walnut, and cotton yarn to, to, to construct the bench, and there are no uh, metal joineries in this. It's only uh, wooden joints. So that was it was a beautiful piece that we wanted in the show, and she was interested in submitting it. So this piece is mine. It is a K9 kit. And we were tasked with a brief of designing a kit for a hobby or something um, that there was an opening in the market for somewhere, a kit that needed to be made. And so when you look at getting a dog, a lot of different places, they sell these things separately, but there's not really a one-stop shop for each piece. And so I designed a collar and a leash and a dog bed, and I designed the print on those and hand stamped it and then sewed them together. And then there's also a dog bowl and a rope toy. And all of these go into um, this box here, which is shaped like a dog has. And then this next piece is by Adrian Myling. He is a student at OTU and he is from Spain. Um, this piece is a stool and uh, it assembles quickly and intuitively. It was CNC'd um, and it is based around um, being sturdy but delicate with the design um, and having repetitive 2D shapes that form a uh, larger 3D space. And Daisha's puddle side table was based off of a by the Earth to Sky series created by designer Doshi Levian. And she created this out of metal and uh, cut and welded it together. And it is inspired by a puddle and replicates the shape that it would create on, a, on the ground. So this is my piece titled Conspiracy Factory. Uh, it started as a end of semester project for my graphic design two class uh, in the spring semester. Uh, and the, the prompt for the project was to explore uh, any topic that we were interested in uh, through any means of graphic production. So I've always had uh, sort of an interest in conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theories, pseudoscience and stuff like that. So I thought this was a really interesting opportunity to sort of make something uh, fun and playful on that topic. Uh, and when we started the project, uh, Obviously, due to the pandemic, we couldn't do a normal end of semester project. Uh, everything went digital. So uh, this, this project was sort of a way for me to uh, remember the good times in studio with my studio mates who also have a passion for conspiracy theories, uh, while also making uh, a unique object that sort of pokes fun at that idea. Uh, so for the project as a whole, uh, I created about 15 different uh, unique conspiracy theories uh, and symbols that went along with them. And this was a postcard that uh, featured one of my conspiracy theories, Don't Trust Soup. Um, and it was printed by Takeout Studios. Uh, and it was just uh, sort of a really cool opportunity to see uh, one of my designs be a uh, mess mass printed. This is a project by Michael Goodwin. He is a senior in the industrial design program. Uh, it is called Pasta 101 and it's sort of a kit for uh, people who want to get into making pasta at home but have never done that before. Uh, so it provides all the tools that you would need to do that in one little bundle. This project, Time by Stills, is a video cre created by Gregana Gocheva. Uh, she is a recent graduate of the graphic design program. And the video explores themes of time, femininity, and its delicate and fragile connection with nature. Uh, Gregana said that she was uh, inspired by the pandemic in a way to uh, create this video since 
a lot of people have experienced sort of a skewed per, uh, perception of time and also have gotten more, uh, created a deeper connection with nature. So this, uh, this video sort of combines those two topics for her. So this is Megan's piece and she created this called Back to Nature in order to water her plants back home because she's a really good plant mom and I really admire her because I cannot keep a plant alive to save my life. So what she had to do in order for this project is she learned how to use a CNC machine and she learned how to use it really efficiently so that she could make a beautiful piece of, it's not furniture, it's like a usable, it's industrial design. She did an amazing job and she waters her plants with it and she uses it in her bedroom right now so she did such a great job on this that it's functional and it would be in her bedroom if it wasn't in our gallery because she wants you to be able to see it and see how beautiful it is. And then this is Gabby's. Gabby designed a bag set and it's called XYZ Bags. And the reasons why it's called XYZ is because it's kind of like et cetera. So instead of saying et cetera, et cetera, you'd say X, Y, Z. So everything that you need to ever go anywhere, you can have in these bags. And then all of these beautiful designs, they're nothing like they look in person. So you should definitely go and see them in person. And if you would like to learn more about the designers pieces or their bios, uh, we have uh, sections on our website for each designer um, showing a little bit of background into their projects and themselves. Yes, and we'll show you the website in a little bit too. So we can show you how to navigate around there. So after choosing the pieces, um, our next step was to really like sort of plan in the pandemic. And this is where I really think something interesting came out is that of the team, uh, I knew Claire previously, but I had never met Kara and Evelyn. We talked to them for the show and we had not met in person until after the show was created. We created this entire show, like, oh, this is the Zoom show, like over Zoom and planning everything, just only using the digital tools around us. So obviously we couldn't really access the space until just prior to setting up the show. So uh, nurse sat down with me and helped me figure out uh, really how the space, like she had a file for the space and helped me uh, give me some good tips because she has curated so many shows before. And then we um, essentially laid out where we wanted all the pieces to go. Uh, and this is the plan that we worked with using our digital tools to set up the show in person. So with the COVID-19 restrictions, we could only have four people in the space at one time. So the setup was a little, a little bit more difficult than it would be. Otherwise, we we had to section out everyone so that they weren't in here at the same time. Um, so I spent a lot of time, you know, like shuffling one person in and out. Um, but for every designer who came in, we set up their pieces and they momentarily unmasked everyone. Like that. But we wanted to get one picture of their piece with the show uh, before they headed out. And obviously, we couldn't have Brian's picture in here because he was unable to. Set up, set it up themselves. This is everyone who came in and set up their own pieces. Uh, so this was um, the space essentially before them. It was completely bare, and there were some podiums in the corner. Uh, we wanted to create a show essentially out of as as minimally as we could, and we wanted to give it a really sort of joyful but fun and amateurish uh, atmosphere. Um, so here it is before setup, and then here's with uh, here it is with all the pieces. And so the next section of our uh, uh, came, comes with our digital experience. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the brand that we wanted to create for Amateur was something that was uh, really playful and fun and approachable. Um, because as we mentioned earlier, this is all student work. And um, we sort of recognized that uh, it could be a little bit intimidating for students to uh, submit their work to an event that is featured as part of the Detroit Month of Design. So we sort of wanted to uh, create an environment where students would feel more comfortable and more confident to uh, showcase their work. Uh, and this, this is really enforced in every aspect of the branding uh, from the color palette to uh, the sort of uh, soft and squishy blobjects that you see uh, everywhere in the branding. And uh, it was also uh, really important to design for digital um, in, under normal circumstances, there might have been a lot more uh, print design happening, but uh, we knew that the event would be, uh, you know, 
really mostly digital. Um, so we wanted to sort of take advantage of that by uh, really pouring a lot of time into the website design uh, and sort of making that experience feel as real and as tactile as possible. Right. Do we want to do the walk through the website now? Sure. Okay. I'll stop sharing for a second. So when you enter the website, uh, you're greeted with this sort of uh, map of the physical space. And you can navigate through each designer's project on the right-hand side here by clicking the icons. Uh, and then you can view images of the designer's work and uh, sort of learn more about their process and them. Yes, and we, uh, when it came to the branding of the show, Claire and I had, we wanted this really, uh, we wanted a very light and fun atmosphere that uh, essentially we wanted to run the opposite way of a professional aesthetic as there are a lot of design events and we see a lot of schools that will, uh, that really like try to almost over-professionalize their events. So we wanted to sort of flip that on its head and embrace the fact that this is an entirely student run thing. We're students and we really want to show off the joy and fun we have doing this because you know we're, we're not yet uh, professionals. We haven't lost our souls yet. We're, <laughs> we're, um, we're really enjoying. We wanted to show off the joy that we have through there. And the, I think the one thing that we showed Kara is that we wanted blobs. She took the rest of this and ran with it. So she was really responsible for the entire website layout uh, and everything you're seeing here. And she was really incredible that we had given her such a little, uh, little direction. And then she came up with an entire brand based off of that. Yes, uh, Alessandro and I, we had created a Pinterest board of inspiration of what we kind of wanted our branding to be. And she really took some of those ideas and just totally ran with them um, and did made it better than we could have ever dreamed. And thank you, Kara, it, it's amazing. Yeah, so, thank you guys for, for inviting me on the team. It's not super often that you get so much freedom when working with a client. So it was a really, uh, really fun experience. So as the map and the icons uh, was then something that I designed after her brand, seeing the things that she had designed, I wanted to, uh, we wanted to essentially like create this digital key that you could understand that would represent the physical gallery. So um, I really took the pieces that uh, everyone had made and wanted to make a simple, joyful, uh, amateurish icon for each one. So we created the map based off of our original CAD map that we had built. And we set up the physical piece according to this janky little map. And, uh, uh, and we wanted, and so the, Excuse me, the direction, uh, the direction and walking path of the show was uh, partially to mimic treasure maps because we found that to be a very fun, uh, engaging thing, and also to uh, enforce uh, more enforce the social distancing guidelines as we don't want people crowding around a piece. We wanted just more single file people walking through the space and the gallery. So here is a walkthrough of the pieces in the space following the map. So this is really how we intended the gallery to be experienced following the map. And with the physical space too, we uh, wanted to keep it um, very minimal, uh, really showing off the pieces as much as possible. And, uh, and we used, so we ended up using like a, almost like, uh, we used a lot of, maybe not like professional tools. So what's on the floor is essentially just ticker tape that we wanted to, uh, that we use to show the direction on the ground. And this is what you greeted with uh, as soon as you walk through the door. Um, it is our little description of the gallery. It has the curated, uh, the curation and leadership team and shows all of our student designers on there as well as uh, the virtual uh, code to the website that you can access as you are visiting the space so that you can if you wanted to know more about the pieces, maybe instead of having physical hangups on the gallery, we wanted to bring the digital element into the physical experience as well so that all that information is accessible to anyone uh, in the space with a phone. 
So here's the, full, uh, the fully, fully set up gallery. Um, so yeah, we really use this map as the base for the whole, the whole event. Um, and uh, yeah, this is something that you know, we're very proud of. Um, and then we have the projection too coming off, uh, coming off from the floor space. So for our big takeaways from this event, we uh, really discovered that organization was key. I think Evelyn can expand a little bit on that and how uh, e efficient and uh, better we became after organization came into our event. Yeah, so one of the biggest things in designing any event is you have to be organized, especially when you're not meeting in person face-to-face. -face. Because if you have one list on paper, I don't have access to that same piece of paper. So all I can do is take my own notes and maybe I didn't take them right. So what I did when I got here is we, set, we sat down and we made an assignment tracker and we made a Gantt chart. So our Gantt chart had all of our big dates and events and we decided how long we were gonna spend on things and when we needed them done by. And we can see it all like visually laid out. So we made sure that the website was done before the event was done. And we made sure that we had all of our podcasts done before school started. And so just being able to see everything is super big. And then our assignment tracker allowed us to take what we had and what we needed to do. And it let us break it up into all the different people so that we made sure that our big tasks had smaller tasks and we knew who was doing all of the smaller tasks so that we could get all of our big tasks done. And then another thing that's super duper important is our drive. Our drive is like our hub. Without it, we would be so lost because everything that anyone ever does for our amateur hour gallery goes in our drive. And we have it currently labeled in numerical order, starting at zero, zero with all of our base information and going all the way to, I think we're at 14 and that's all of our presentations so that we can follow all of our steps chronologically and we can find everything that we need. Prior to Evelyn arriving, the entire organization of the show was stored in Snapchat chats. So <laughs> uh, it was a huge upgrade to have her coming on and she really kept us going. And we realized essentially after her arrival that how much, uh, how much more capable we were to, to accomplish things and how much more efficient we were in getting things done. Uh, it was super helpful. I've never seen anyone run a Google Drive like Evelyn. It's really yeah. When we really say impressive. organizational guru, we really need guru. It is incredible. And a really another big takeaway for us is really just remaining adaptable and flexible. Um, just thinking, having we had to constantly just change our direction and change our thing. Like even when we brought uh, leadership on halfway through the summer, we were like, yeah, we can probably have like a small opening event of like you know ten or twenty people. Uh, I think up until maybe the last month uh, before the show, we were uh, told that we could have you know 10 people in the space at once. And then that quickly went down to, all right, you can only have four people in the space at once. And you yourself have to docent and uh, show people around. And really just constantly having to roll with the punches of the global situation uh, was really something that we kept ourselves available to always change and to always, uh, always you know, we, we really weren't knocked down by a lot of things. We decided, all right, you know, we can't do something. We're just going to change direction. Another big part, a uh, big takeaway from this experience for us was the real world experience working with Design Core. Um, we had to put together our first submission in order to be accepted into the Detroit Month of Design. And then from there, we put in a press package, different uh, descriptions, uh, just had to work with them in order to create content that they could use to market our event as part of the Detroit Month of Design. And that was something that is really important in the professional world of getting yourself and your work out there. Really too, also I think it was very almost an emotional thing is that we were considered to be like on the level of the other professional design events that were on there. I think there was 11 exhibi physical exhibitions listed in the design core. Uh, month of design pamphlet and to be one of them is absolutely incredible uh, that we were able to as students create something that was considered uh, it was essentially like, you know in the same list that all of our favorite local designers were like to see our professors 
of the local designers that we looked up to and were like you know, on that list with them was really, really amazing. And honestly, the fact that we were able to complete anything at all with the circumstances that were uh, that we had, I'm just incredibly proud of the team. Uh, it was it's been an awesome team and awesome designers. And really, thank you to the people who like supported us. It's really been amazing to see us actually have something that we're proud of physically get put in in this crazy, crazy year. Is there any uh, any anyone else from the team have any big takeaways that they want to touch on before we go to the next selection section? Um, one thing that was just so awesome was definitely seeing the professional marketing done by Design Core. Uh, I was walking through the city the other day with my boss and my boss's boss, and we saw one of the stickers on the ground. Uh, it was like a large, I don't know if it was a sticker, but something that they put on the ground around the city and it said Detroit Month of Design. And I was able to explain what it was uh, to my boss and my boss's boss, which was awesome to be able to really like see that we were put out there in a way that really allowed anybody to see it. Yeah, and like Claire was saying, we're out there for everybody to see. And that was not a small feat. We were actually selected to be one of 40 events out of 120 submissions. So we were better than over 50% of all of the other people in order for them to like and see our things. So my mom back home, she like has a little pamphlet and I think she's gonna frame it and hang it in our living room. My pamphlet's right above the uh, monitor right now. I have it pinned up on my desk that I look at every day. It has our little page in it next to, uh, we're next to the never, next, the, our image is next to the science gallery and the never normal exhibition at Wasserman Projects. So yeah, it's just really, really happy that we were able to do something like that. So next, uh, Evelyn and Kara can talk about the future of the event. So this is gonna be a recurring event and we're gonna try to have it again next year at the DCDT. So if you would like to have your own work in our event next year, submissions are going to happen again around the same time, second semester next year. And you can submit whatever you would like. You can submit multiple submissions and we will go through all of them and we will make sure to pick out the best of the best and we'll put it up and you'll get all of your information put up with our gallery and you'll have a podcast about you. And really it's just great experience because I don't know how often you get to have your work in a gallery while you're in undergrad, but it's such an amazing experience because you go and it's a professional event. Like everyone's gonna see your work and you're gonna practice putting yourself out there for other people too. Yeah, and we're also uh, we're really excited to expand the leadership team for next year's gallery. Uh, sadly, uh, Alex and Claire will be graduating in the spring, but uh, me and Evelyn are hoping to find some, some awesome new people to uh, join the team and help us make this event even better. And uh, to, if you are graduating this year, you can still submit to the show as it's open to anyone who, anyone who attended school during the 2020 to 2021 uh, school year. Grad so and on the grad, right? Yes, same, same as last year. So with that, are there any questions? I want to jump in and start the questions. Um, you mentioned your podcasts in the beginning of the talk, uh, but can you actually talk a bit more about those and maybe show where they live on your website? Um, is that Kara, Kara, do you still have the website pulled up? Yep, I can show that. Okay. So they live in two spots. Um, they are uh, physically on the website and are also on our YouTube channel. Um, I think that was, at least, at least for myself and I think a lot of the team, we've always wanted to uh, have like sort of a concrete thing to be interviewed on a subject or to be asked about our work. So uh, in the curate creation of this event, we wanted, especially if with it being digital, um, we wanted to basically bring in the elements that we'd like from an audio tour, as well as what we like from podcasts. And I think it's an interesting way to learn more about someone's piece rather than just reading a little paragraph 
uh, to really listen, like to learn more about the designer, uh, especially when it's people that uh, we don't really know as much. I've listened to all the podcasts and a lot of the, some of the designers we had never, uh, I had never met in person or knew much about their work. So to listen to their background and something about, and really understanding the story behind their piece is really incredible to, uh, to understand the work that they went through to complete their work. And Evelyn ran, uh, ran all the podcasts. Great interviewer. Our newest podcast is Kara's. So if you would like to learn why you cannot trust soup, you should definitely listen to Kara's podcast. So I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for this presentation. Um, super inspiring, I think both for me and also for all of our students who I think are probably very empowered by seeing you all model, you know, going out in the world and presenting your work in a public space um, and doing a really beautiful job um, with the production of the show and, you know, now the way that you're presenting this work. Um, I was both inspired by the quality of the work, but also about by the quality of your collaboration. It seems like you guys all really like each other, which is very impressive when you do a really difficult big project together. Um, and, and so I was really surprised when, um, when Alex said that some of you hadn't even met in person while you were designing the show. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you built such a strong collaboration amongst yourselves, you know, students with from different disciplines, with different interests, I'm guessing, different commitments, um, different passions, and, and whether you had any moments of conflict, how you navigated those things, how, how you built a, a strong kind of rapport amongst yourselves. Hmm. That's, a, ooh, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> um, shocking well, that we, um, I don't think we ever had any conflicts. Um, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, it was, I it was sort of us against the world trying to make this event happen, so. Yeah. I think There's... the only conflict would have been when Evelyn showed up and was like, hey, uh, you guys need to get this all sorted out because it's, like, it's kind of a mess. And we were like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's why you're here. <laughs> we uh, knew that, though. Yeah, we yeah. hadn't met uh, all in person until we took the photos after um, we had set everything up. And we just realized this during our Zoom meeting the other day. I was like, Oh my gosh, the first time I met you guys in person was when we took pictures together. And I didn't even realize that because we had had so many Zoom meetings and uh, calls about this that it was so strange that we hadn't met in real life, but it was very nice to be able to collaborate with them. And I think with, uh, I think we definitely got lucky with, uh, I mean, Claire and I, we've worked together a little bit before. We, we've known each other since our freshman year, but uh, bringing Evelyn and Kara on, I think it was, I mean, it was a lot of luck that they're just awesome people to work with, but really, I think it was the attitude that we, like Kara said, like us against the world and that we really, we just knew like how we, we very much realized that we had like, especially with the coronavirus situations, we had a blank canvas to do whatever we wanted. And uh, we all, I think, I think we're all very much go-getters and we all really want to make an imprint uh, and we want to do something right uh, like it's, you know, it's why why do it if you don't do it right? Um, yeah, so it's really just I think it's the culture and especially the attitude of the show too is that it was based entirely around hey like this is fun let's just do what we think would be fun and I think focusing on that instead of making it this gargantuan task really helps as well as Evelyn breaking everything down for us into very small tasks that we could easily do. So it really looks like a series of very small tasks instead of one just gargantuan thing of like you have to have an event and you have to uh, have all the promotion for it. So yeah, I think it was just our personalities blend really well and we're all really dedicated to doing a good job. And by making our tasks smaller, we actually allowed us to do fun things as well. Our biggest bonding moment was when Alex told us that he bought a beige sweatshirt and then we were like, oh my gosh, we need merch. So we all have matching shirts that Kara made for us. And that was my favorite part of like working with them is we're just like a family a little bit because we bonded because of this. 
Yeah, and also I just wanna mention that uh, we were, I think we're all, even though we had sort of tried to create this atmosphere of uh, like approachability and casualness, we were all pretty nervous to, uh, you know, that this event was actually gonna happen. Um, I remember just a few days before our virtual opening, uh, we were all meeting over Zoom and sort of none of us could believe that it was actually gonna happen and that, uh, you know, we'd worked so long for so many months to make it happen and that it was actually coming to life. So just that moment of uh, seeing, you know, seeing our hard work pay off was also a really awesome uh, bonding moment for the team. Yeah, I think it was a little bit too of the digital where we uh, really didn't, like I don't, I think that I thought this is, I think this is shared among the teammates is that it almost didn't, it didn't really feel like a real thing that we were working on. Like we were just sort of doing stuff until I think like when I, for me, it was real for me when I went to run the setup and it was like, oh my, this is actually like, we're not just playing a game. Like this is a legitimate thing that we did. So at least in my brain, I was like, this event isn't real. It's not, it's never going to happen. I'm sitting in my room on Zoom with some cool people. I'm not actually doing like, a design event, and then it suddenly just happened almost. What would you suggest um, to students who are thinking applying to the to your next event? I would say uh, make your package and have it ready. Uh, a few of the submissions that we had gotten, people hadn't completely physically made their projects. And if we had accepted them, you never really know, like, are they actually going to finish? And we didn't want to be left high and dry. Um, so one thing that we really emphasize with the submissions is have the piece ready or almost ready to go so that we know that it will be in the gallery and won't just be like kind of an empty promise. And it worked out really well and we got all of the pieces into the gallery and they looked great. I would also say just like submit it. Like if you like something or you worked on something, like we approached a couple designers um, and looked at their work and we asked them to submit and they were like, oh, I just you know, didn't feel too confident in submitting this, that's why I didn't submit it. Like if there's something you like and that you've worked really hard on, uh, I would say submit it because you never know how it's gonna be perceived. And also like you can submit more than one piece, like the stuff that you like, like you never really know what's gonna catch the eye of curators or what's gonna work like in contact with other pieces that are submitted. Like it might not be something that you find to be impressive or interesting, but you really never know how someone else is gonna perceive it. So I would say just really like have the attitude of just like, if you're interested in it, go for it. Maybe if you don't get chosen this year, like do it next year, just like, just be excited and be interested, I would say is the advice from me yeah and the um leadership team can always use more help so if you're not if you're maybe an underclassman or like not super confident in your designs themselves and like the way that you have presented your products uh go for being in the on the leadership team it is a great way to kind of get your foot in the door and see some very good design and get the professional experience um and then from there kind of work on the development of your own projects and yourself as a designer. Thank you. Okay, I do have any... a question. Oh, yeah, I have yeah a, go ahead. I just, I just have a question for the, the rest of the leadership board because I don't think I've asked this question. So besides your own piece, What's your favorite piece in the show? I've got my, mine is Kara's. Hands down, I love Kara's. Um, when I got her postcard in the mail from Takeout, they had, they put out envelopes of prints every month and I got that print and some other ones in the mail and that one was my favorite. And I did not realize it was an LPU student. And when I saw her project on LPU for I was like, hold on a second. I have that right here. And I reached out to her via Instagram and was like, hey, I love your project and we want it in the show. And then a few days later, I was like, hey, we love everything about you. Do you want to do the branding for our show? And she totally did it and ran with it. And it was awesome. She did the logo in like one day, right? Yeah. Like it was less yeah. than a day. She gave us like, Kara, do you remember how many options you gave us? Like, uh, okay. I mean, it's, it's hard to remember because that was back in like, what may 
Um, yeah, but it's, I don't know, it was, it was sort of, uh, it was easy to get the creative juices flowing because I was so excited to be uh, brought onto the team and work with you guys. Yeah, but that's my favorite. I don't know about anybody else's. <laughs> I got to say my favorite is, is Kara's as well, but a second favorite will be Daisha's piece because that's another piece that I thought, because uh, I saw it in the, uh, it was in the same exhibition that my lights were made for. So it was the uh, Dish ex exhibition. And I just thought it was a professional designer because almost everyone else in the show was a professional designer. And I saw it on the website and I was like, oh my God, student, student made this, like we have to have it in the show. Yeah, per personally, my favorites were, um, I really enjoyed uh, Brian's bench. Um, he talked about how he, uh, he sort of got the idea for the bench after seeing how those, um, uh, the uh, I believe they're called art donkeys, or is that what they're called? Yeah, uh, you're right. Yeah, seeing those uh, sort of like big clunky things that were sort of hard to carry around uh, being used by students uh, in, you know, museum settings and different settings like that. Uh, and so that he was able to design something that could, uh, you know, disassemble into like a flat, uh, easy to carry object was a really cool uh, problem that he solved, I think. And the fact that he was able to uh, get it here under such difficult circumstances was also uh, super exciting. One of my favorites is actually the pasta maker because I learned how to make pasta, but I'm really bad at it. So I need a beginner's kit to help make pasta. And I actually, I asked Mike if he would let me use it and he said, yes. So I'm gonna hold him to it when he figures out how to make blades and I'm trading my secret sauce recipe for it. I saw him last night too and he told me he'd still make me one. Um, I was wondering, is the physical gallery still open right now? And like, if I want to go to it, do I have to schedule an appointment or can I just kind of walk on in? And... Um, are you, if you're an LTU student, it's open during uh, like the building's open hours for you. Oh, okay. Uh, and it is available until November 14th, I believe. Okay. But if you can't make it in person, all of the content and more is on our website. And so... I would suggest to go to both. Okay, thank you. And if you would like a personalized tour and you would like our little insights, you can send us an email and we will give you a tour. But you don't have to go with us if you're an LTU student or a faculty member. Yeah, we have like, we, that is one, I would say one takeaway that we, we found is that we, uh, it was a, a part of the adaptability is that up until the, right before the show launched, we, uh, it was not a requirement that we would have to uh, dose in everyone who was not from LTU. And that was something that we learned, uh, that we learned, I think in August. And uh, we, we all, I think all of us have a lot of extracurriculars. Uh, yeah. We all like part-time jobs, uh, other things they do out of school. So <laughs> we, I think we had a, like only a couple hours a week that we could <laughs> We could do sense, so that was something that we were a little bummed about. But you know, as part of rolling with this with the punches and the requirements that uh, we had to work with, um, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that a little bit. I think it was something that changed our uh, physical viewings as well. I've got a question for you. Um, after everything was said and done, and you had a chance to look at your work and and the result of all the collaboration. Uh, did you create a list of what you would do next year uh, for uh, improvements or things you wish you'd done? Um, I would say personally, I, I don't have too many, but I think that what could be done next year is definitely a list that Evelyn mm -hmm. and Kara can talk about. It's, it, I think it's interesting too, because it's going to be their, their event heading up next year. So I'm very interested to see like what they changed about what we did, what they keep, it'll be cool to see. Yeah, Kara and I have not had a meeting about that yet, but we definitely will after we move everybody out of the studio, just so like we can see how moving in went and then we can see how moving out went and then everything in between. Mm -hmm. uh, I think so, yeah, that, that's something as well. I think the pandemic really switched up as it was really like, 
I don't think we have as many things like, oh, we would do this so much differently because we don't know how, like the situation was, you know, it's already different than it was in September and it's definitely going to be a lot different uh, next year. So it's a bit, I think it's a bit that the situation that we designed this in really gave us a lot of unique things that I don't know are applicable to a lot of other times. So I think that, yeah, I think it's like almost like a one-off, it feels like in a way. What would you um, recommend to um, people that who want to come into the organizational team? Um, this question can be asked in multiple ways. Like, what would you tell um, February, March, February, March, Claire and Alex that they should watch out, or or um, also people coming in who? What are you looking for um, from the person who wants to join the organizational team? I would say passion and consistency uh, and like professionalization, uh, just being able to kind of keep yourself on track and not uh, lose sight of the event as a whole and actually like getting it on its feet because I know that's something that with Al Evelyn we struggled with like completely like getting everything together and that's something that we definitely uh, look for. Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly what I would say too. Like the passion and uh, type sort of time management consistency is is big. But I, yeah, I would say definitely passion is the biggest one. Just being excited about this and doing this because just doing this because you want to do it. I think is a big thing that I would say. Yeah, but I if you were to tell me that it was going to be this much work and this, it was like everything was going to be, uh, I mean, this interesting. I don't know if. Like, I think if I knew that it was going to be this much work, I don't know if I would have said yes, just because it would have sounded like a lot. But because it was broken up and because we all managed our time very well, it really doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like a gargantuan task until we look back on it. So if you do want to join, just know that it's not as bad as it sounds when you first hear about it. It's not, a, not that much work. You've got a lot of months to do it. And I will be on top of you and Kara will be on top of you. So really, you're just having a good time with us and you're putting together something that's super cool. Yeah, yeah. If, I were to, if I were to talk to February Claire, I would say, get a hold of Evelyn right now. <laughs> For sure. They got a lot easier after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, you can also take solace in the fact that we already, uh, we already encountered a lot of problems and figured out how to work through them. So uh, I think we can only be stronger moving forward. More prepared. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I think it's going to be a little, it's going to be easier next year to run it because we do know the pitfalls and, and the problems that we ran into. And we've already done it once. So like we know the things that worked. And we know all the steps now. So we know starting out who we all need to contact. We know that we need to start out by writing down everything we need to get done and blocking out the time chunks. And then we know that next we need to go through and we need to assign things and then just stay on top of each other. And then just keep going until we open the gallery. Yeah, I would say it's a lot like a semester project. If you just break it up week by week, you're going to be able to get something really incredible done by only doing each day's work. Yeah. And then at the end, you celebrate a little bit. Maybe pizza party. I think we pitched that. Hopefully, hopefully there'll be an in-person one next year. Yeah. Maybe pizza party, maybe matching t-shirts. Yeah. So for Evelyn and Kara, if you guys were thinking next year, would you only do physical again or would you want to have some more digital elements as well? I'm thinking that we go ahead and we keep rocking and rolling with the dual virtual and physical experience. Yeah, um, I think that, uh, you know, Claire and Alex talked about how really up until uh, sort of August, we were expecting to have at least some sort of small uh, you know, in-person opening. Um, and then obviously that did not, that was not able to happen. So I think in the future, we'll sort of, uh, we'll plan for the worst case scenario, assuming that, you know, it's, it's a scary possibility, but there is a possibility that we still will not be able to have uh, in-person events around this time next year. So I think that we will, uh, we'll sort of plan for the worst case scenario, so to speak. Um, and then, you know, 
work work up from there. Plan for the worst, hope for the best, get some matching masks. Yeah, I think there's also something to be said that Alex and I are um, industrial design students and that's very much about making a physical product is what like kind of we do every day. And with Tara and Evelyn being graphic design students that really opens up a different door that Alex and I weren't super familiar with and we don't really have a whole lot of experience with that. I'm wondering what, so I think all world um, kind of learning about this virtual exhibition or the virtual show uh, experience. And you guys were one of the pioneers because um, Design Month Detroit never stopped, right? They were like pushing everyone to create a virtual presence as well. What would you say worked? And I, I think you found like clever ideas like matching the maps to a physical exhibition. And then you were doing um, Instagram promoting a lot. And then you were doing podcasts. What would you think it worked? Uh, very well that uh, you think that it will actually continue in the time that we will have uh, physical um, gatherings. Um, that's one when I, I'm wondering because there must be things that you want to keep, right? It's not about um, pandemic continuing to, till the next year. Personally, I really, I really like the podcast. So I'd like to see that stay because I think that's a that's a really engaging way to get to know the designers. Um, and I think to understand their work is really something that, I mean, obviously there were design podcasts prior and there were uh, like, you know, audio tours, but I think really adding and keeping that element um, and making it very visible and prominent uh, really gives you a more personal relationship with the work that you're seeing. So that's something that I would like to see stay and I would like to see other events Really incorporate. I would like to see those translated into maybe like face-to-face -face video interviews um, where you can really see the designer in action, see like how they speak about their project because the podcasts were just like over Zoom and it's a little bit less dynamic when you can't uh, see the, the two, the interviewer and the interviewee interacting with each other and with the project that they are talking about. So for submission work, uh, next round, would you guys want to keep it only physical like you mentioned for this? Or would you want to try to do the half and half? Like do some digital and then some physical element? So how we're going to run submissions is everyone's going to get an email. And then the email is going to be like, Hi, we're Amateur Hour, and we want to see your work, and we want to put it in our show. And so in order to submit your work, you're going to send a PDF document to us. And in that document, it's going to have the title of your piece, it's going to have your name, your major, and your grade. And then it's also going to have a little bio about your piece and why you made it, and then images of your piece. And then it's also going to have an image of you, and then a little bio about who you are. And then we'll come through all of those and we'll email you and we'll let you know whether or not you got picked. And then if you did get picked, we'll run you through the next steps. And if you didn't get picked, we'll tell you to reapply next year. And we'll see if you wanna get involved in other ways. So I just wanna clarify the question that was asked a little bit. So are, uh, who asked that if you're, are you asking about in terms of physical and digital work that will be submitted, like the kinds of mediums that would be showcased at the event? Yeah, I meant showcasing if you were thinking of doing, because I know you guys said you only showcased physical, but if you also wanted to showcase like some digital as well. Um, like if you made an image digitally or like a video and if you could submit the video. Yeah. Yeah, so we actually had a video this year and Gurgana made it, she's a great lady. It was a video about plants and nature that showcased her femininity and like learning to embrace her femininity. So if you want to make videos or stuff like that, we can showcase that in our gallery and we can also showcase anything physical that you make. So if you make some furniture or if you make some cool postcards, we can have those too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Gurgana actually originally submitted a, uh, 
project that was more user experience app based and we didn't really have a way to uh, display that physically and have people interact with it. And so we, when we saw her video project, we thought like, oh, that would work great in the um, gallery. And so we asked her to submit that instead because that kind of fit our brief and our theme a little bit better. Yeah. Um, oh, but the it's reason... really up to Evelyn and Kara, um, I, whatever they have planned. And too, if you did make, uh, that was like kind of an exception that we had open. The rules were a little hard for us to like qualify, but if you have a digital piece that can be showcased in an interesting way, like the projection, that is a physical thing that is like, it's a physical experience. So if you do make digital work, but you find a really interesting and engaging way to present it uh, in a physical space, then there's absolutely no reason that you wouldn't be included in the show. It's really just, it, it's very difficult to, with some all digital pieces to showcase in an engaging way for designers because we didn't want to just have like posters or like slideshows, like having something that has like motion or motion graphics are super interesting to showcase. So something that has like an interesting element that can be showcased in a physical space is accepted, I would say. That was our qualifications for last year. But if you come up with something super cool and you send it to us and it is digital, Kara and I will work with you to get it in the show. Yeah, and um, I believe that Claire and Alex mentioned this earlier, but um, when they were going through submissions, uh, there were some or quite a few submissions that were sort of uh, not fully developed ideas, which is, you know, there obviously there's a lot of potential in those, but um, to actually go through the project of making your digital thing or your idea, uh, making a physical object out of that is sort of a whole other level of, uh, you know, passion and work that you have to put into it and sort of provides a completely different uh, and more in-depth experience. And we wanted to showcase like some, some of the uh, opportunities that students have. As a student at LT, we have access to the wood shop, to the make lab, to the print lab. And as a professional, you have to go out and um, either purchase those tools or like seek out someone to who has those tools to help you with it. And we really like the idea of people creating their own things while they have the opportunity to do that and to be doing something that they're passionate about. And while they are free enough to not be like stuck down by professional stuff. Thank you, everyone. I think we're about time, but is there any last question? Whether on YouTube or Zoom? I'm gonna give it a minute. Yeah, I do have one last thing just to drop. <laughs> if you wanna, if you wanna contact us, um, uh, ltuamateurhour at gmail.com is our email and uh, our Instagram. You can respond and see messages there. Um, and then a big thank you to, to the DCDT for uh, letting us use that space. Amazing. Thank you everyone uh, for joining. Um, I think it was very informative and great chat. Um, yeah, thank you for organizing this. It sounds very, very fun. I'm, I'm glad you take on. <laughs> to be honest, at the advisor, I was like, they should they should do this i'm glad you stuck with it um yeah good job bye